last time we looked at a simple DX vapor compression system and how it was split between components in the zone and components out in the ambient air. With a chiller, all of those four main vapor compression components are housed internally in one device called a chiller that interacts with the chill water loop on the evaporator side and the ambient air on the condenser side if it's an air-cooled chiller. So regardless of the type of chiller, it's always going to have an evaporator barrel. And that can come in a couple different configurations depending on how the refrigerant is indirectly interacting with the chill water going past it or alongside it. There could also be a plate and frame heat exchanger, although this is more rare. But with a plate and frame heat exchanger, as you can see with this diagram here, you have very close contact, high pressure loss interaction with the two loops split across these alternating plates. So with the water cooled chiller, we're really just going from a condenser coil and evaporator barrel to two barrels. So on the condenser side, you have a condenser loop that's running out to a cooling tower or a series of cooling towers. Now the chiller itself is going to be pretty pretty easy to spot if this is the case. A water cooled chiller should be inside and you're going to see these two barrels to where with an air cooled chiller you're going to have condenser fans and condenser coils and it will be outside. You can address large loads when you're using a cooling tower. It can be more efficient than just an air cooled chiller and you can have a little bit more control as far as what loads you're able to get rid of what the capacity is of that chill water system at the same ambient wet bulb dry bulb conditions. A little bit of drawbacks, there's some added pump fan energy, higher first cost for the extra infrastructure, there's some more treatment needed, there's makeup water which if you're in a uh, drier environment can be an issue. Uh, you have water loss and blowdown. You need to control things that's needed to be able to house these things. Uh, there's also a little bit of maintenance that comes with it, but when you consider how much water is used at a power plant, it is important to consider that there's a bit of a balance between a little bit more water used on site with some electrical savings versus water that's used at the power plant to generate that electricity. But one thing that I want to stress in the context of RCX is that with this extra equipment and these extra loops you have extra complexity and now you have more things that can go wrong so we're going to talk about things to look for in a cooling tower with the makeup water with leaks how we run those fans so there's just more to look at but cooling towers can also come in a small variety such as this space shuttle looking device here uh, they're just not seen quite as much so I would say at about five tons or less is where you might not have a chance of seeing cooling towers like this. And just to establish a ton, as we're going to talk about going forward, is just a unit conversion equivalent to 12,000 BTUH of cooling capacity. There can also be direct and indirect cooling tower, which is again just adding a heat loop. So you can have the condenser water interacting directly with the air being, in this case, drawn up through the cooling tower or you can have just a short loop that's spraying water on the condenser water pipes and is cooling it sensibly only. So in any case the the theory is really the same it's just taking advantage of these extra heat loops and having some ability to to take some latent energy out of one of these water loops. So far we've looked exclusively at vapor compression cooling as the form of mechanical cooling that we see in our buildings. There is also absorption cooling and, and, and other types out there, but I'm going to limit the discussion really to this slide here due to the fact that absorption cooling is really going to be limited. It was very popular before the advent of vapor compression in the early 1900s, but except for applications where waste heat is available to drive this cooling process, it's going to be far less used than any vapor compression products that are out there. But just to go over the, the kind of guts of it, you still have an evaporator serving chill water and you still have a condenser with a loop out to say a cooling tower, uh, but that's about where the similarities stop. The refrigerant is typically going to be water and there's a salt solution 
that's constantly absorbing and then kicking out the water. And it's that, that process that drives the cooling here. So instead of work being input into a compressor, you have heat being added to a generator. And that's why if you have waste heat, it can be convenient or it can be advantageous to have something like an absorption chiller on site to be able to generate cooling from waste heat. But other than that, we're going to see a lot more commercial cooling applications with typical vapor compression chillers or DX units. So we're going to limit our conversation to that. But if you have any comments on wanting to get any more discussion on absorption cooling or any type of examples or exercises, uh, please let me know in the comments section.